Good afternoon. In this video, I'm going to be going over the is legal move function. So this function takes a move object as its input and then simply returns true or false. True if the move is legal and false if it is not. If you are not quite sure what the move object is, you can watch the video I made on the move class. And this video is going to be a follow up on the video that explained how the get possible moves option worked. If you remember that function ignored the legality of the moves because it plans on the set it returns it plans on having the set it returns being filtered by this function anyway. So is legal move. Actually I'm gonna go ahead and explain why I had to divide these two up. If you can imagine a chessboard well, you don't have to imagine a chessboard. I will show you a chessboard. Hmm. Yeah, sure, I'll just go ahead and show it. I made some changes today and I haven't updated it yet. My changes are in the cloud, but I haven't pulled from the server yet, so this won't have the changes I've made today. But anyway, if you can imagine a situation in which so I have a bishop here, and so I'm thinking about writing my program, and I think, well, let's write a function that determines that determines all legal moves. Well, it, it of course has to determine what type of piece we've clicked on, and that determines where it can go, but it also has to determine a couple of intangibles, like whether or not this pawn can move. This pawn can't move. Why? Because the bishop is attacking it. But if I haven't written the function yet that tells the game that the bishop can move that way, I can't write a function that determines what moves are legal. You see, so there can't be a function that returns legal moves if there is not a separate law that governs the way pieces can move. So there's in fact two separate factors that determine the legality of, move, of a move. There's the capabilities of the piece itself, and then there's also the circumstances. So get possible moves addresses the capability of the piece itself, right? As you can see, it, um, if there were no circumstances, this is where the pawn would be able to move. In the version that I updated today, these won't highlight. It won't actually highlight moves that can't be made. But I guess it's good for this illustra these illustration purposes because you can see that's what would be possible regardless of circumstance. So that's kind of a hard to understand concept and it took me about a week to understand. I kept trying to write a function that returned you know, legal moves a piece could make, and I kept running into this same problem, and I was wondering, you know, I thought may maybe I'm doing circular reason, I don't know what the deal is, so here's the problem again. I can't write a function that determines whether or not this pawn move is legal, right? So if we're assuming it's one function that determines the legality of all moves, it's going to be the same function that determines whether that move is legal, that also determines where bishops can move. But I remember, as I'm writing this function, the laws are not in place that govern this bishop's movement yet. So I can't know, I can't tell the program that the pawn can't move here because of bishops, because the program has no idea what bishops mean. So I have to separate the logic. I have to write a separate function that tells the program, hey, bishops can move along diagonals. Then the program can look and say, ooh, this isn't legal because bishops can move along diagonals. So that's the idea behind separating those two out. Anyway, I will not exit out of the program this time and just run down. So all that to say, this is why we need two separate functions, and here is the isLegalMove function. So first, these, what are they? First eight lines of code are just convenience, right? They take this move object that's passed in and unpack it and get handles on all of the variables, sort of all the tools that, we're going, that, it's, that the function is going to need to make a good decision. So it needs a convenient way to identify the start. So we name, get a coordinate handle on the start, and the, we get that from the origin of the move object. We need to know, we need to know what kind of piece is moving. So the way we determine that is we ask our, this function asks the board for the slot object at a particular coordinate. So we ask the board, hey, what piece is on the start coordinate? Right? And so we call that start piece. Start type, 
We ask the piece, hey, what type are you? We get the type. Start team, we ask the piece, hey, what team are you? And we get it. So coordinate destination, we get the destination from the move object, and these three should look familiar. They're the same as these three, simply with um, the destination. So we ask the we ask the board, hey, what piece is on this ob is on this slot? We get a piece object. We ask that object, hey, what type are you? Are you a pawn? Are you knight? Are you a king? Then we ask it what team it's on. Now that we have all that information, we can move on into the good stuff. So here is a really fun function. Uh, check if the move is a castle. And that looks like I'm calling a castle a rook. Anyway, that was going to bother me. So this line of code, if the start type is a king, because a castle queen side and a king side, even though both the king and rook move, it is considered a king move. So I considered a king move in my code logic. So if the start type is a king, so if the if the move object that we've been passed in deals with moving a king, and the king is moving from an x coordinate of five, right? And the destination is either x of seven or x of three. What does this mean? Well, we're saying okay. So for us to even consider whether or not it's a castle, we have to be trying to move a king, and it has to be trying to move to either here. Let's clear out all of these pieces so that you can get a good view of what's going on. So they click on a king, and we're considering whether or not a move is a castle king side or queen side. The first thing we have to do, we say, well, is it a king? Okay, then we can consider it. Also, is it starting on this column? Because if the king is not on this column, then he has moved. There's no way around it. And if the king has moved, it can't be a castle. So the next step, the next thing we check, is it a king? Okay. Is it starting on, is it moving from its starting position? Okay. Is it moving to either column seven or column three? So what does that mean? If it's moving to column seven, then it's trying to castle king side. Well, that's appropriate. Okay, we'll allow it. Or if it's moving to column three. So Let's uh, try to get the program to show a castle queen side. Boom, boom, boom. We have to clear things out. So we can see it started at five and moved to column seven. The program said, okay, I recognize that as legal. And we actually got to here. We returned true. If it's starting at column five and moving to column three, the game recognizes that as legal as well. And it just moved the rook, which is a bug that I had up until this point not known about because I hadn't tried castling kingside with one piece and queenside with the other. So I will have to address that. That's rather interesting. Anyway, yeah, it considered it a castle kingside is what it did. That's really strange. <laughs> Maybe what I did today, I fixed a lot of the logic that addressed castling and I might have fixed the problem I didn't even know about and the changes I made today. I made them on my other machine, so they're not evident yet on this computer. But So that's the idea behind this first, these first three lines, this if block. So if all those conditions are met, okay, let's move on and think. What other conditions have to be true for a castle? Well, those in-between slots have to be free. So if it's a white piece, we're worried about these two slots being open. You can see the slot 6, 8, and 7, 8. Well, you see 6, 8, and 7, 8. Oh, I didn't. So if those are empty, if slot 1 is empty, if slot 2 is empty, and white can castle king's hide, that's a big if. I'll explain that variable in a moment. Return true. Now dealing with queen sides. If 2, 8, 3, 8, and 4, 8 are empty, so 2, 8, 3, 8, and 4, 8, if these are all clear, the king is starting here and it's trying to move there, that makes it legal. Wait, no, because what if the rook has moved and now moved back? Then the king wouldn't be able to castle. So that's what this variable addresses. White can castle king side. This starts off as true, and if the rooks or kings move at any point in time, it becomes false. 
So that's sort of the gatekeeper, the guard against um, a situation that looks that looks castleable but isn't. So I'll go ahead and rerun the program to show you how it how it recognizes that state, and then I promise we'll move on from castling soon. Castling was one of the toughest problems I had to deal with. So what if we have a situation that looks Right now, if I castled on each team, it would be legal. But what if I move the rooks and then move them back? Well, I just set the white can castle king side and the white and the black can castle king side values to false. So since they're false, it's not going to allow me to castle now because it says, no, you already moved the rook. So that's, I guess I'll show you that black can't do it either. See, click, drag, no go. That's what these variables do. And of course, there's one for king side and queen side. I had to separate them. If the king moves, these both become false. Both king side and queen side are now impossible. But if the rook moves, well, you're only you're only axing one of the options. If the king side rook moves, well, we can't castle king side, but we could still castle queen side. So there have to be four separate values for all of the four options. Okay, now we have this line of code. If start team equals desk team. What this is asking is the player trying to move his piece to a piece to a slot that's occupied by another of his pieces. So is he trying to move the pawn here? If he is, well, return false. That's not a legal move. That one's pretty simple. So set of coordinate possibles equals get possible moves, start piece, start. What is this saying? It's saying, okay, this is the the main logic of how I determined whether moves were legal. I got a set of coordinates, a set of destinations for the start piece. Okay, so we have possible moves for the start piece. And now what we do, let's say I did knights first because knights don't have to worry about jumping over pieces. and. The, and fixing the jumping over pieces problem was one of the uh, the biggest challenges. But I think this video is long enough already, so I'll cut the video off here and pick up where I left off in the next part.